And could be that some of us do coding, could be that some of us are into solving projects um, and site building. We kind of have these discussions. Is there a real site builder outside Drupal? Like the job definition, um, does it really exist outside of Drupal? It's kind of Drupal specific because there's um, there's all these things that we can do through the user interface. Um, and I think that's a, that's a big, big advantage of Drupal um, and Drupal in general. So coming from myself, starting with Drupal 5 and 6 and 7, um, there is a lot of stuff to talk about when we talk about contract modules. Um, the good thing for me personally to, to kind of try and reduce the scope for this talk was that not all the modules are ready yet. Um, I guess that's the reason why we're here, to find out what of the mo which of the modules are to be used and which are to be used. Um, anyone with an academic career, anyone has studied? A few? Yes, cool. Um, so I kind of would like to get lost in the complexity of tasks. Um, and this task definitely has some complexity in it, assessing which are the modules that we can use? Should we do it? Um, well, today I will tell you my story. And the story will be in those chapters. So we'll talk about how we can realize content structures, what's up with content editing, a building part, um, the display of the helpers. These are categories that I came up with in order to kind of fit in all the different site building modules that are out there. Um, and as there's more than a hundred, um, I am applying kind of a methodology to, to prioritize which, which are the modules that are relevant to us as an agency, which are the modules that are relevant to me as the site builder. So I will talk about which modules I consider to be useful, so that's what I want to focus at, and how far are they in terms of stability, how usable are they. And I will also talk about which are the core modules and the contract modules, so they would be annotated as a small plus sign. And a few examples, so for example, F5.5, it's like the old star module that is already ported, it's already stable. That's the second five. And the first five is how relevant is it to me? What is the usefulness of the module? And we'll find, for example, a not so useful module, already pretty stable, but on the other hand, a, a module that we want to use, but it hasn't been ported at all. <clears throat> so let's dive into the content structure part. Content structure. Um, is really kind of the selling point for me when I talk to people. So my role as a tech lead often is not implementing the site itself, but discussing with our project managers, discussing with the client. What is it actually that we can build already for you? Does it make sense to start this kind of project with you today, or does it not? And as we have a list of five types, uh, I feel pretty confident that we can realize all of those needs in terms of can I build up a system based on nodes, can I add all the field configurations to the system, I, I have access to entity reference in core now, uh, I can upload files, the file topic will come up later in, in more depth, um, but I can process all this information and I can really implement complex content structure applications with Drupal 8 already. And we started doing that more than two years ago with early alpha releases of Drupal 8. So I'm very um, confident that the sites that we've built so far, for example, in our, in our case with launched eight customer websites based on Drupal 8, um, that they all can rely on a a lot of features in terms of content structure, but also um, they are pretty stable. It's, it's not all of it, 
So I have a few more, and I'd like to mention these because you can see there's none of these modules has the plus sign, so that's all provided by Drupal Core. Just imagine how much you can do with Content Structure already just by installing Drupal Core. In Drupal 7, we were relying on a, a separate module for links, for telephones, for example. Um, oh, I forgot the field group, that's actually a country module. Um, but yeah, we can see that all of those, they, they are pretty far. Um, and that's kind of cool. In the next chapter, so we have the content structure in the system, we build out our content types, they are pretty flexible. We can create relationships between users and content, we can also create different uh, block types. Um, but then somebody has to enter that content into the system. And that could be by our web service, but that usually is the, the end user that we configure on the website. So here, <clears throat> it's a bit less, but um, so we have now WYSIWYG in core, which is pretty awesome. So on a, just out of the box, you, you install Drupal 8, you will get the WYSIWYG, you can configure filters, uh, and that's pretty cool. And what we at Amazing Labs really like to use is the Paragraphs module. Yay. So, <laughs> yes, that's all for that. It's basically a, a fork of field collection, and you should definitely check it out. Uh, it really changes the way that we, that we put our clients in charge of creating complex landing pages. Whereas before, we would predefine all the different sections of the web of, of a landing page, and then the client can fill out them. With the Paragraphs module, we can prepare different kinds of uh, text elements. That could be a row of gallery images, that could be a slideshow, that could be an accordion based on whatever information they can input. And then the client themselves can choose from a, from a palette of possible text elements and then just arrange them in the way they, they want it to be. So you definitely check out the Paragraphs module, it's also compatible with multilingual in Drupal 8. So that's really good. Um, something that kind of got disabled in the, in the last phase of the Drupal 8 release cycle is the inline form errors. Um, and that's something that we always install on our Drupal 7 sites. Uh, the EIFE module allows you so that whenever the user submits a form, he will not get presented with a list of errors and then has to scroll down to find out what, which of the form elements was affected. But actually the form, er form errors will be displayed in line. And that's really a usability plus um, and something that you should also enable on the Drupal 8 sites. A lot of excitement has been around for a quick editing or the Spark initiative. I have to say that it doesn't work in a lot of cases, so there's some bugs with it. And I also think that it's not really being honest to the, to the editor if they just work on the visual representation of the website. There might be cases where it makes sense to make a quick edit, but if we hide the complexity of the content by uh, not letting the user understand what is the actual content structure in the backend, uh, we will generate errors. You can see that all the time when our clients try to translate stuff and then the translation doesn't match the semantics of the word anymore. The same can happen in this case. Like the client thinks it's just a quick fix, so I'm gonna press quick edit on this part of the site. But if they don't understand the underlying structure, um, it can cause a lot of problems. Media. I'm really glad that we have uh, one of the most active developers of media, not in the room, but at the conference. So, find Janus, he will present tomorrow a case study. It doesn't state explicitly that it's about media, but it contains a lot of the, the way how they go there. So, media is really important for us because, well, in the end, that's what Drupal is often criti criticized for. Um, the media handling is kind of there's Scald in Drupal 7, there's Media Module in Drupal 7. It's all kind of tricky to put it well together. And it's definitely still a pain point on the Drupal 8 sites that we build. 
So <clears throat> the media module, as you can see, has a two, so there's, there's a bit of it, but it's not really completed. But you should definitely check out uh, the media initiative because they created a lot of separate modules that will allow you to already, for example, entity embed would allow you to embed entities into the WYSIWYG, which is the part of our functionality the media requires. So that could be ready earlier than the whole media itself. Um, also, file entity is not so far, so at the moment, when you install Drupal 8 with the files, you can upload them, but you cannot edit them at all, you cannot do, you cannot do much with them. Other, on the other hand, of course, you yeah, have images, setting up effects and styles is pretty cool. And also, responsive images out of the box is something that we have already implemented for a couple of websites, just by enabling the picture module of Drupal 8 core and um, I think. So media, media handling is it's getting better, but <coughs> expect some problems there. Multilingual. Yeah, well, for us, being a Swiss company, uh, we often have to build websites, four languages, five languages, just for Switzerland itself. Um, so we are really interested in, the, in multilingual, and we have actively been participating in the, multi, <coughs> in the multilingual initiative that made incredible progress between the 7 and 8 cycle. So while on Drupal 7 we were installing about uh, 5 contrib modules just to allow the different translations of content, configuration, and fix, fixes for web form and so forth, um, right now we don't rely on any contrib modules for the multilingual features of our Drupal 8 sites and everything is translatable. So there's some small caveats, so I gave them fours because, um, for example, in, in the case of redirects and the caching of redirects, we have to use patches at the moment. Um, but in general, everything is, is pretty, pretty good. And you can see it's been split up into managing languages, and then you can enable, if you want to be able to translate the configuration, the contents, and the interface of the website. Just being able to translate everything doesn't mean um, that it's easy for the end user to do the, those translations. And that's what TMGMT is all about. And that's not so far yet. Uh, I think it's, I, I personally not tried it much out. I, I think it's like a usable prototype. But uh, I'll give it a two because we, we haven't really um, seen much of it yet. Workflows. So that's also a topic where I try to push the customer into a let's get a minimum reliable product first and then implement all the crazy workflows you want to have. Um, just because they would require custom coding at the moment. There is no uh, there's no UI for revisions. In Drupal Core itself now is better support for revisions, but there's no module that exposes them. Um, Workbench is, hasn't been started to be ported at all. Uh, we're kind of excited um, being one of the initiative leads for D8 rules. Uh, we just got funding for a second milestone, so we will have a minimal viable product uh, for rules by the beginning of March. So that's kind of cool. But just means today I cannot sell rules to my customers. Um, so any workflows that, like the notifications or any automation that you would implement with rules in Drupal 7, today uh, you would have to do in custom coding. Organic groups, um, they have started a port, but I wouldn't consider, um, or I haven't, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen a use case where, where it's really in production yet, um, so that's also not so far. And when you look at the core specifically, there is an action module, but note that rules have to fork the action system, so I wouldn't rely too much on the actions at the moment, um, and I honestly don't use the historic, history or activity tracker modules. Okay. Do you accept questions, or should we wait? Sure. 
if you get up your rules, I think it could do the job. Have you look into it, or you don't like your rules? Sounds good, no. I'll have to check it out. Because yeah, then it was a standard solution in D6, and in D7 we had more special operations, and it seems to have revived. So, so, so it's like a replacement for a request moderation? I think so. it's it's basically giving you the, the back end API. It doesn't give you the front end of request moderation. It does give you. It gives some of it, but not for the, the nice reviews but you could build that. Okay, cool. So my understanding would be that we can have different workflow states, yeah. but we don't have a UI to So basically you have to create the proof. rules and actions that do the changes according to the state changes. To, to yeah, the right. got it. Cool. Well, thanks for the mention. Also, if you have questions for the individual <laughs> topics, we can talk about them afterwards, or you just raise your hand while presenting. Okay, building. We already talked a lot about content structure, um, um, what is building and what is not building maybe on the discussion, but uh, what fits for me in here is the menus, and yeah, they are pretty cool. In Drupal Core you get the menu UI module and the menu link content module that just allows you to create all the menu links that you need. Um, in my case, I would need the domain system, for example, uh, for more complex websites. Um, that's not there, that would be probably something that has to be integrated with menus as well. What's a, what's a bot taxonomy menu? Good question. Not that, not that I know which is the state or something. Mm -hmm. But I will, I will show a link afterwards where there's, a, there's like an overview of all the content modules that I didn't mention probably. Or if somebody knows. Um, <coughs> Forms. Um, that's kind of a tricky part. So uh, the web form module was always its own ecosystem. And what the web form module is really good at, it empowers your users that log into the website to create their own uh, questionnaires. Uh, and there's a system in Drupal Core called the contact module. It's quite limited, but it already allows you to define different types of forms. Uh, you just have to be aware that it's configuration, so it has to be done in the background by an administrator. And it doesn't store anything by default. But um, we're using contact storage, a contract module, to do that. So instead of relying on, or waiting for the web form module to be ported, um, that's the solution that we take on at the moment. And there's also a module called eForm, that's entity form. Um, that has been existing in Drupal 7 and already has a first version in Drupal 8, but I haven't tried it. So if, you're interested, if you have a need for building forms at the moment, I would either go with contact and storage or with the E4 module. Search engine optimization. Um, Drupal per default is considered to be very SEO friendly, but we usually rely on a couple of custom modules, uh, contract modules or custom code to to optimize it. Um, yeah, Drupal Core itself provides the path module so that you can customize the UL aliases manually, but that usually doesn't make a lot of sense because um, we want to auto-generate the paths. And we already use uh, path auto on most of the sites. Uh, it's just a bit, it has some glitches with, with multilingual at the moment, with the language prefixes, um, but uh, it basically works. Um, also, meta tag, it's quite interesting. Um, you can, like when you install it, you don't see anything, uh, but you have to add it as a field to the entities. And there you can configure the default uh, meta tags mappings. And also, when you edit a node, you will just be able to, to override all the meta tags. Um, and of course, it integrates with the token module. Um, so that's pretty far, actually. Also, the redirect module. Um, has again some issues with languages, but works pretty well. And finally, we didn't, we couldn't use the, the XML sitemap module because it doesn't work at all with multilingual. Um, so that's why we're using the simple XML sitemap module uh, that basically does the job. I'm also mentioning RDF because recently we get more and more question if we can implement schema.org and that was like a, an initiative for Drupal 8 to, to switch from RDF to schema.org 
And there's been a lot of discussions on uh, how to do that. At the moment, you cannot disable RDF. Um, so the schema logic you would have to implement uh, in a custom way. Um, finally, display. So we got all the content structure. We also built our menus. We optimized for SEO. Um, we want to make sure that the visitors can actually see content on the website. And how do we do that? So we, besides the, the field system itself has the managed display, so that's pretty flexible. And I think personally, uh, Drupal 8 having Twig um, as a template engine, uh, we feel more and more comfortable putting the front end as totally in charge of building the layouts in templates. Uh, whereas in Drupal 7, we always did panels everywhere, have analyzer and so forth, kind of in order to standardize how pages are built. Uh, panels now has a first release, um, but we have been using Page Manager and the Layout plugin exclusively uh, to build static landing pages, means like the structure is predefined. Because I, before I mentioned that we use paragraphs to create landing pages or to put the clients in charge of assembling their own landing pages. But if we know the structure has to be fixed for the landing page, um, there is Page Manager, which allows you to create pages, and then the Layout plugin is needed so that the structured layout can define which, uh, which regions should be available, and they can then be um, populated with blocks. Um, yeah, I should also mention the block system in Drupal 8 has, has improved a lot. So also if you... Um, it, it supports the context API, so the blocks can be can be much more intelligent um, and just more fun to, to program. Uh, listings, well, use is a core. Um, just mentioning all the core modules that are there, uh, and that pretty much works. Like, I'm not aware of big troubles there. Um, search is um, pretty far, like the should be more than two, actually. Um, so it should be four, four, I'd say. I don't know. I mix, up, I mix those numbers up. Um, so we're using Search API um, for some projects already. Um, just have to know that in views, you have to, to select a, a specific um, role formatter for, to, to be able to work with Search API. Um, and that's really cool. And there's also connectors for Elasticsearch or for Apache software. Um, we just don't use this, the core search module too much because it's limited, it doesn't scale well, and you cannot use the, the features of a, of a real search index. Um, I've heard that Facet API is already ported, but I haven't tried. Has anyone? Works. Yeah, I shouldn't use the downcode <laughs> Maybe not. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, and yeah, I'm also maintaining of the Facet API pretty pops module that has an import. Um, <coughs> mapping solutions? Yes, for Facet API pretty fast. I talked to you the one behind the uh, Facet API and about the task, because we did that one as well. He, he went, yeah, not seeing that integrating with Facet API anytime soon. So, the pretty pops module? Yeah, pretty fast, plus the way that uh, Facet API is working right now. Um, he didn't see any way to get that to integrate. Yeah, so it's a pretty disappointing. It's a hard problem. Yeah. But uh, maybe we should talk about this during the conference. Yeah. Cool. Any more questions here? Yes, pretty fast will be included with Facet API itself. Yeah, that was the idea. Okay. So we know separate modules. Let's see if we can do that. Maps. Um, as we, with any fancy widget, I uh, try to educate that we shouldn't always think in there's a module for that, because having not so many modules available actually is an opportunity for us to create less, less technical depth on the project that we implement. Who has seen a Drupal site that has more than 100 modules installed? Okay. <laughs> so, um, I, I always... <laughs> Who is afraid of upgrading those sites? Well, you get it. So the last 
the last modules we install, um, maybe we can just, for the fancy widgets, like for example for slideshows, we don't install a module, we just, um, we just apply a JavaScript library to do that in front of uh, The same can go for maps, um, unless they rely on, on Drupal data to be uh, displayed. But then also you can, can use, for example, the views GeoJSON module, which will provide the location informa information as a GeoJSON feed. And then the front of the JavaScript library can just consume that feed and display it, uh, without any deeper Drupal integration needs. Um, yeah, there's also GeoFeed, Leaflet, Google Maps, um, but I personally would recommend them. Yo, helpers. So, for the administration, it was really surprising to me, like, I didn't expect the presentation to, to go like this, because first of all, I wanted to talk just about country borders, and then I figured, like, okay, let's take a quick look at a few core modules that are there, but there are so many core modules in Drupal 8. Um, so just that we know that, that the administrators, they can benefit from a lot of stuff. Um, there's contextual links all over the place, you can create your own shortcuts, there's a help system, um, there's toolbar, uh, which is responsive, which is great, so everybody can build websites on the phone now, um, and that's, people actually do that. Um, and we use the admin toolbar, uh, similar to admin menu, so it quickly allows you to, to dive into the, the menu structure, which is, which is obviously awesome if you're a site builder, and if you don't want to click too much. Um, services, yeah, the, <clears throat> there's a RESTful services in core. Um, I just think the way that they present data is very tied to Drupal, and that can make sense, but that can also be not so sensible. Um, and in Drupal 7, there is, for example, the RESTful module that allows you to, to customize the data format that you want to have. And you should totally check out Fugi's session about GraphQL, uh, where he, he presents, I think, like a forward-thinking way of assembling the data in order to, to talk to, for example, a headless uh, implementation. Um, but yeah, Drupal Core itself has a serialization method called HAL and RESTful Web Services in Core, uh, which I, yeah can be can be super cool, but it's uh, I think also a bit limited. Um, Performance-wise, uh, there was some really awesome improvements. Um, mainly, Ben Lewis was working on that, so. <clears throat> we have a, a dynamic page cache that really understands uh, which, pa which part of the website can be, can be cached and which part of the website should be loaded dynamically and the performance gains are, are really, really good. Uh, we use Varnish in, in front of all of our websites and the Varnish module itself is not really there yet. Um, so the, the, the caching validation is, is kind of, yeah, it's not available as a module for you. Um, configuration management, CMI, that's part of core, so no more feature module, um, at least for deployments um, that follow, just I wanna deploy everything that I did on the site. Um, so that's pretty awesome. Uh, we have been playing around with the features module, which now is in charge of, I wanna group the functionality into reusable parts, um, and that didn't work out so well. But to be honest, um, I, haven't I haven't dived too deep into it, and I'm pretty confident that people are working hard on it, so I uh, I'll definitely consider checking it out again soon. From then, uh, just wanted to list here, uh, we use always link CSS, so that um, that's debugging works properly, that the, that the CSS is, is properly linked, and um, the advanced aggregation module that we use a lot, um, in order to, to optimize with where the CSS is put, where JavaScript is put in the header or in the footer, how the aggregation works. Um, I didn't see a point there available yet. Finally, migrations. It's pretty cool. Um, oh, there's a, the lower part shouldn't be there. Um, but yeah, the migrate and the migrate Drupal is in core, which is basically the APIs that you can use. 
And there's also a migrate D2D, which has a UI module. So if you're a real site builder, go check that out. Um, and you can already configure the migrations through the, the user interface. Um, and there's a lot of more stuff in Drupal core. Um, system, the update manager, um, the breakpoint is a dependency for the picture module, serialization, uh, the testing system got a lot better, um, and we, like I mentioned, the token module, so that's a requirement in order, for example, for path auto, so that I can specify the automatic patterns, how they should be built up. Um, that's kind of, tokens are there, but they are not really working for the entity, like there's no integration with entity metadata at the moment. Um, yeah. So, for example, a colleague mentioned a module that I have no clue about, um, but there's resources that know more than I do. Um, so go check out the cont content tracker. It's based on different issues uh, with statuses in order to provide a, like a board where you can see how the mod in which states the modules are. Uh, and the systems, also from Switzerland, they have been heavily working on a lot of content modules. And they also have a status overview that focuses primarily on test coverage and if the tests work or fail. Um, there is also a website about the top 100 contributed modules listing there when the latest releases were and so forth. And Christoph previously passed by mentioning that the Drupal 8 upgrade service is available or you just put the URL of your existing Drupal 7 site and it will tell you um, these modules are already ready, these modules you will have to wait for. So definitely check that out. Um, yeah. There's actually another slide. Sure. Um, there's, a, um, there's a site called um, contribcanban.com, which actually has all yeah. the, the Drupal modules in the Kanban, so you can see in which state they are. Right. So isn't that the basis, or that's the content tracker issues that get visualized in the content camera? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Can, I, can I have a quick question? Sure. How many of you work for a company that has internal trackers for the same thing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, we work for the same company. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of my impressions is that like, we're lacking uh, an initiative that would just coordinate all of these trackers. We have a GitHub repo with the module being ported, we have stuff going on on Drupal before, we have internal trackers, and we have currently four additional resources where you can track the same thing. So I think it would be a good idea if the community could just coordinate single points where everyone can dump their stuff in. Yeah, totally. I mean, the, that form for me now would be the official one. The, the one that, for example, WebChick worked a lot on it. Um, so it has tickets for all the, the contract modules, and when you go on it, it's broken. <laughs> so that's maybe not the best time to check that page. Um, but it has 560 issues that the com community contributed for. So basically it has one issue for every module stating in whichever state the porting is. And this one is actually inject, uh, injecting those uh, comments on the project <coughs> page, right? So when you go to the project page, yes. uh, it displays that there is a DA branch of the module, and it's being ported here, and here is the issue. So I think it's a really Correct. So when I scroll so down here, was it there? It's exactly there. Right? Yeah. So, you now have in the section above the releases a link to the to the tracker issue. <coughs> so I think that's really helpful. I just well, I, I came up with this with this categorization based on because the question is also can like everybody has their own priorities, which are the modules relevant for me, which are the relevant modules relevant for you. Um, so I'm not sure if if it will ever be possible to 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 use one canonical source for to understand which of the modules, for example, your company are relevant. Um, 
Yeah, but I understand that it's it's also quite a drawback that when we all have the different most of a lot of them are automated, so that's cool. Um, So is anyone tracking the Drupal 8 modules personally? How do you do it? Um, oops. Well, that would be the time for questions. <laughs> Follow you. Um, what would you say, like how many country modules do you use on average on a project? Yes. So I have a Drupal 8 starter and it's like 12, 13, 14. So we, and we don't add much more on the sites. Like most of the, most of the projects, the layout, like page manager, paragraphs, path auto, re redirect token, meta tag, field group, they all just make sense. Um, but it also depends on the complexity of the project, of course. Like, We've been trying to standardize the needs of the projects that we take on the Drupal 8 onto what is possible. Um, Theodore. Yeah, so you say it makes sense. So should they be in core as well? I mean, we're not going to stop them. So. <laughs> well, I think there should be a small core and a big core and a super big core. Um, look, the, the evolution or the, however, like we will now have the, the semantic versioning for Drupal 8, so we can definitely improve a lot of stuff. For example, for the rules initiative, we want to improve the action system. Um, what was it? Uh, like, yeah, I think that's. We can never put everything in core. The, the layout plugin, for example, there was a layout module in core, it was removed, maybe it will get in again. Um, but defining what makes sense for core is not something that I want to be charged with. But a good question. What do you think? Uh, I was asking the question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I have the impression that uh, this placement used uh, more than oh, yeah. to perceive a seven that you didn't mention. No. Why not? It's a blind. Um, so I have a, a, a session at DrupalCon about coding versus clicking, where, you, where we explicitly talk about display suite versus panels versus and so forth. Um, I just didn't add it here because it's not something that we use at all. Like I was, I was assessing the modules that I would usually use, um, but that displacement is definitely something worth, worth mentioning because it has been ported pretty early on um, and it supports the same layouts as the layout plugin provides. Um, so we do, should definitely add it to the section about uh, <coughs> when we talked about. We've talked about layout display suite should do that. Yes. Yes. Maybe to add something to that, because we have actually been using it quite a bit for Drupal 7. What you see is that there's a small part of display suites that we used to use on every project. And now that small part is actually part of the field UI that comes with it. And so the more advanced stuff that you only use on some really small project, uh, well, on specific projects, that's the one where we now need to install this. It's still there, but you don't need it nearly as often. Can you provide an example for that? Um, well, I think all the the stuff that you that you had on nodes, for example, that were just not accessible, like or that you wanted to hide. For example, I don't want people to be able to change the author of a note. That's just not their business. It doesn't matter who edited that. Uh, before you had to like do uh, form alters or all kinds of things. Uh, so in this case, it's not display suit, um, but there is pretty much everything that you have um, that is getting displayed is available in the UI. So you don't need modules like display suit that makes more things available. Um, and so just because everything is much more consistent, you don't need these helper modules. 
Most of the stories that we hear in this talk is about let's say, the building of the certain site in Group A. Uh, what do you expect uh, from, from your type of concrete markings? Is it really diverting Group A from Group A? So, who? I know that that with composer and with symphony components there's a lot of possibilities. Um, but to be honest, maybe because I've been using Drupal for so long, it's kind of like <laughs> um, yeah. Do you have any suggestions? Like something new that you see on the horizon? We're so in from six to seven. A lot of concrete modules were about uh, fields, entities, display panels, that, that, that type of module. Group of five to six, most of the time, uh, we're making, making structure. Not making structure. I don't know. Is that an open question? But, but this, uh, what you said about symphony, it will really, really open up to other uh, areas. Should expect that. So we can yeah, I think especially, and, uh, yeah. especially especially for the separation of front end and back end, I think there will be a lot a lot to tackle with. I just mentioned quickly the services that are provided by Google Core. Um, something that I'm excited about is the context API. So we share that across page manager, panels, and the rules module now, so that we can all talk about structured data that should be parameterized as an input or an output. And I think from there, uh, there's a lot of possibilities to, to make like, in, since I joined the Drupal project, more and more reusable components came up. Like first there was CCK and now it's fields and it gets a bit down into entity metadata and then it gets even better now in Drupal data. We have the type data system, which is not tied to entities anymore. Um, so I think if we can continue in a way of making stuff reusable, and maybe something also that you will learn in the commerce session, I don't know when, it, when it's exactly, but the commerce people, they just decided on the, let's not build it the way we built it before, but let's try to think of all the problems in individual libraries, and then make them combinable, reusable. Uh, I think the interoperability of Drupal Having been more a uh, monolith, now getting covered, like being inspired by the Symphony framework of independent components that can be combined in an intelligent way, I think that's also where we see <coughs> the bigger Drupal sites want to go to because um, instead of one big site, maybe I have a federation of services that talk to each other. Um, but that's something I would love to discuss if anyone is interested in. Um, but I don't have a, a clear understanding yet of how it will look like. Cool. I think time's over. Yeah, there's no more questions. Thanks, everybody.